Often loading is not actually um, applied directly to the mass, as you can imagine, um, but rather the mass of the system ex is excited from the base, which is a, which is attached to. Um, so that's called base excitation, right? What a what a stunner. Um, so you know, examples might be like an automobile excited by a road, right? So your base there is going to be your your bumps in your road, you know, machines on rubber mounts, um, buildings in an earthquake. Uh, when I worked in Alaska, I learned that everything that's bolted to the wall in a hospital has vibration standards associated with it. And so, you know, hospitals hire engineers and, and your whole job is just to make sure that things are installed correctly, right? To, to be able to read a spec sheet and sign off on everything, particularly in seismic areas. Um, and honestly, if you think about it in a place like South Carolina that hasn't had a significant earthquake in 120 years, the next one's gonna, gonna really suck. So we're not really prepared for it. Um, I'm sure the stuff in California is mounted correctly and the stuff in Lexington is not. So, uh, so base excitations. So let's consider the following system mass. Um, and we're gonna draw it like this, right? So we have a spring we have a dash pot and we have a base. And I have to stop drawing this with a fixity, right? So we're gonna have a vertical displacement X, but now we're also gonna have a, a base displacement Y. Um, so now we need to do our free body diagram for this, right? So this one's a little bit, um, a little tricky. I don't think it's bad once you think through it. Um, so we can, ex So what we're going to do is we're going to take our mass and our equilibrium position. Right? And, and X is pulling up. So K is going to act which way? Down. That makes sense. So we have K delta. and we have our mass due to our gravity, right? So now, so that gives us an equation, um, the sum of forces in the X is equal to negative K delta minus Mg, which is equal to zero, All right? Now we have to do our displaced position. So now this one gets a little bit um, a little bit tricky because we, we have a driving force Y here. So, so what do we consider our, our displaced position? And, and the way to do this is, at least when you're building this free body diagram, there, there's lots of ways you can, you can do it, right? So you can have your forces in other directions. But the way I like to do it is to kind of keep consistency. And let's assume that we, we grab onto the mass and we just let the base drop. Right. So then we're going to have forces that are acting down. So we have our mass here. And we're going to have a force acting down for K delta plus. Now, what do we what do we add to this? Right. So we want our displacement X. Uh, minus our displacement y, because we have to subtract one from the other, because we're really just interested in the change in distance between our, our mass and our base. So we have k delta x plus x minus y, and then we have mg. I'm going to draw the smaller, just so it's a little easier. And then we have c, and what's our c? Yeah, right. So we have our velocity of our mass minus our velocity of our base. So we can we can draw this all out into one equation. Some of the forces in the X is equal to negative K 
delta plus x minus y minus mg minus c x dot y dot. Oh, there's a minus in between those two. Right? So we can apply Newton's second law. Um, sum of forces in the x is equal to mx double dot, which is equal to negative k delta minus kx minus ky minus mg minus cx dot minus cy. Um, rearranging, right, and, and pulling out our negative k delta minus mg equals zero, which comes out of this equation there. Um, we get our equation of motion, which is mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx is equal to cy dot plus ky. So it's the mass of whatever is the base not important. Yeah, so it's a it's not a two degree of freedom system. It's a one degree of freedom system that's excited by the base. Does that make sense? So later on, so let me let me draw that. Later on we will do a system that looks like this. That makes sense? And, and then this right one is base excited by this one, right? So you can think about it like that. But, it, but it's a whole system, so the mass matters. And you have mode shapes and eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Uh, well, they love you. So. I like them in different. <laughs> so, last time I taught this class, um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking down and I'm writing. And I'm like, all right, so we remember our eigenvalues, and I write and I write and I write. And you hear Dr. Downey, Dr. Downey, I'm like, hang on, hang on, Dr. Downey, Dr. Downey, I'm like, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me finish off my thought. And I look up, and every hand is up. We've never had eigenvalues. <laughs> Shoot. Well, that's my whole notes for the day, guys. So, uh, but you aerospace have, right? Yeah, so I'm super excited. But I know there's mechanicals in here, so I'll, I'll tone it down. So you're lucky. Um, but I was super excited to know you guys had linear algebra. It's like my faves. So, okay. Uh, so now that we have an equation of motion, which is pretty important, right, we, we want to be able to solve for base excitations. And, and what's the only type of excitation that we've done in this class so far? Force, force. anything, or even the force. Like, what's the shape? Sinusoidal. Yeah, we've always done sinusoidal, right? It's just pretty easy. So we're going to we're gonna assume a sinusoidal in, input here. So um, for simplicity, Right, we're going to assume y of t is equal to y, capital Y, sine of omega b t. Oh, I lied to you. I forgot to tell you about omega b. Oh, we have another omega. That's fine. Um, so omega b t. And so capital Y is your amplitude of your forcing function. That should be pretty evident. Omega b is the, the frequency that it's being driven at. Uh, and then t is time, right? So we can take the derivative of this to get y dot. y dot of t is equal to y. I'm going to pull an omega b out. Omega b sine is going to become cosine. Cosine of omega b t, right? So just like before, um, now we have a, a y and a y t. And that looks like something that we can go ahead and put back into this equation um, to get something that's just in terms of x then, right? Oh, we have capital Y, but we don't have the, uh, we don't have the uh, displacement and the velocity of our 
base excitation. So let's go ahead and do that. So we have uh, mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx is equal to c uh, y omega b cosine of omega b t plus k capital Y sine of omega b t. Right? So we can put this in standard form by dividing by what? Yeah, so m in this case, but whatever leads the x double dot. Um, so we can put this in the standard form um, by going to divide by that. So we end up with x double dot is equal to 2 zeta. Oh, that's not the symbol I wanted. Two zeta omega n x dot plus omega n squared of x is equal to 2 zeta omega n omega b y cosine of omega b t plus omega n squared y sine of omega b t, right? Um, so that gets nice and uh, complicated. However, often what we'll do is we will just go ahead and pull these two leading terms into C and into D. So we can end up with a cosine and a sine term with just kind of constants, right? Because everything in this is going to be a constant and everything in this is going to be a constant. So it gets us a nice, easy equation, which is, well, that's not right, plus, which is x double dot plus 2 zeta omega n x dot plus omega n squared x is equal to c cosine of omega b t plus d sine of omega b t. Right, so that's a pretty cool solution. Okay, so let's talk about um, displacement transmissibility next. So this is section 3.5.1. Um, so again, when we are designing systems, it's the steady state solution that we typically care about. Um, and we are worried about how much uh, force is transmitted, sorry, how much displacement is transmitted through a base excitation problem in a steady state solution, right? This is displacement transmissibility. That's how much displacement does our base move and how much uh, displacement 
tr gets transmitted to the mass, right? Um, again, we're really just interested in our steady state solution here. Right. And because we're interested in our steady state, we're interested in our particular solution. Um, to solve that expression, we want to, again, use the knowledge that our system is linear to solve for a solution. And so we can extract out that xp of t, which is our particular solution, that's going to be equal to xp1. I'm going to put it in parentheses. You just know it's one part of the solution of t plus xp of 2 of t, right? And so now what we have is we have two solutions that we can use to build our steady state solution for transmissibility. Um, so recall that the steady state solution for harmonically excited, excited spring mass damper, right, can just be x of p of t is equal to capital X cosine of omega B T minus V1, where omega B is the driving frequency at our base um, for the base excitation problem, right? So the forcing function we can write from our last equation is that C cosine of omega B T plus D, sorry, D sine of omega B T is equal to XP of one plus XP of two. Um, therefore, we, you know, we'll, we'll drop the T term again for simplicity. Uh, I can break these out, right? Because my solution is a sum of solutions. That was the first question on, on the um, first exam. And so we're going to do xp of 1 is equal to x1 cosine of omega b t minus phi 1 and xp2 is equal to x of 2 sine of omega b t minus phi 1. So we split up our sine and cosine terms, but both have our phi 1, which is the damping term, um, as the phase angle is independent of the excitation amplitude, right? So we can, again, solve this using the method of uh, underdetermined coefficients. Um, by setting, you know, um, you know, for a simple example, right? We can set, we can look at equation, um, look at three point seven one, kind of for an example. of how we did that, right? We just set them equal to each other. We solve through, we build the matrix, we build two equations for two unknowns, and that's how we calculate it all out. Um, but not really worth doing it again. So let's just go ahead and write down the solution we get. So we get xp of 1 is equal to 2 zeta omega n omega b y over um, the square root of omega squared, sorry, omega n squared minus omega b squared, that whole term squared plus 2 zeta omega n omega b squared. <laughs> cosine of omega bt minus phi 1. 
and that gives us a solution for x of one. Um, we can, from our trigonomic relationships, we can get phi of one is equal to our inverse tangent of two zeta omega n omega b over omega n squared minus omega b squared. Um, next, the particular solution asso associated with x of p of x p two, right? We can get do the same thing. Um, we can get x p of two again solve for using the method of undetermined coefficients, but I'm just giving you the answer here is omega n squared capital Y, and Y again is the amplitude of our base excitation over the square root of omega n squared minus omega b squared, that whole thing squared, and omega b is the frequency of our base excitation, plus 2 zeta omega n omega b, that whole term squared, and then this whole thing multiplied by sine of omega b t minus phi 1. So at both have the same argument. Both of these terms have the same argument, omega b t plus phi 1, omega b t plus phi 1. Um, we can add them up, right? Plus or minus? Minus. So yeah, this is a I, okay minus. Uh, so we get x of p is equal to x p one plus x p two. Right? We can add them back up to get a whole expression, um, and we get. X of P omega, oh, sorry, X of P, uh, I can do it, equals omega N. So that's the natural frequency of our one degree of freedom system multiplied by the amplitude of our base excitation times the square root of omega N squared plus two zeta omega B squared over omega n squared minus omega b squared squared plus 2 zeta omega n omega b cosine of omega b t minus phi 1. Now we have a sine and we have a cosine term. So those are going to be off. This is going to be shifted off by some amount. I mean, that's just what a sine and cosine. We could transfer one um, and put scalars on the outside, but that's a little confusing. So we're just going to add a minus phi 2 here. Um, and phi 2 is the offset between the two, right? Now I can solve for that offset by uh, just looking at my changes between my frequencies and I can get phi 2 equals tangent inverse of omega n over 2 phi omega b and that's what we're going to solve for phi 2. Is there a question? Yeah I wanted to ask why like, should there be a 2 on this denominator of xp should there be a, should the 2 zeta omega n omega b be squared even though the other ones they've been squared so I'm wondering why. Oh yeah, sorry. Right there, right there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, sorry, my bad. Okay. Okay. So as before, we want to investigate. Uh, we want to normalize this in terms of the natural frequency of the system, right? So into this, we want to. 
you know, add R is equal to omega B over omega N. Because I'm just interested in what the ratio between my driving and my natural frequency are, right? And I can then plot that out for any amount of stiffness. I can make a plot that's going to be true for everything. And all I have to do is kind of fill in some of my parameters. And if I do that um, and divide by Y, I get equation 3.121, the 121th equation of the chapter. There's a, there's a lot of equations here. So we get X over Y. Now that is my output. Um, over my input, so equals the square root of 1 plus 2 zeta r, that whole term squared, over 1 minus r squared squared plus 2 zeta r, that whole term squared. Um, so that is my displacement transmissibil transmissibility ratio. Um, so what this looks like in a plot is this. So for a given critical damping value, right? So any of the critical damping values I have, we'd have to put our, our mass, not, not critical damping, sorry, our, our damping <coughs> ratio. So what we have in damping over the critical damping, we have to put our mass, we put our stiffness into that, we get zeta. Um, for any sort of frequency function, right? So whatever I'm forcing at it, that goes into R. And then so, and whatever I'm exciting goes into Y. I get my ratio of my response, right? What you'll notice is that for things <coughs> around resonance, when you have very little, um, when you have a very underdamped system, it displaces a lot. That makes sense, right? Generally, so like the ratio of my displacement is more. So you know, a, a ratio of one means I'm going to displace as much in as I get out, right? So uh, a five means I move it a millimeter and I get five millimeters of displacement. So that, that makes sense. It's an underdamped system. If I have a very damp system, I get this brown line. What happens to my ratio, my, uh, my displacement ratio? It's one, right? If I take, how does this cap displace differently like than the base of this pen, right? If I shake it, it just displaces the same amount. Is there some vibrations in this, you know, assumed rod? Yes, but it's very small, right? And so I have a very overdamped system. I get a very, very linear response. Uh, what's very interesting is on an underdamped system, at the higher frequencies, I get very little response, right? So I could build a system, say, that has um, that resonates here. And maybe I want it underdamped because I'm only actually concerned not about the frequency of vibration at that where it resonates. I'm concerned about a higher frequency and I can get less displacement there, right? Or maybe I want something that doesn't, um, you know, that vibrates a lot, but, you know, doesn't vibrate too much at higher frequencies. I might want to pick a different damping ratio. And so that's my displacement transmissibility. And that's what allows me to know what goes through a system. So your homework has like a landing gear problem, right? I think though that's force transmissibility, which we'll talk about next. But you might be designing a system and you say, well, I only have eight millimeters of travel on the back end. So I need to figure out what my displacement transmissibility is going to be through that. So any questions on, on that? And the change over point is just R over the square root of two, right? Again, no, there needs to be a place to change over. No dramatic physical meaning to it. Yeah? Is 
So x over y, that's your displacement over your input. X is your output, y is your input. Right, so coming straight from these expressions here, our capital X, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so let's look at the other, the flip side of this, right? Sometimes I'm concerned about displacement on transmissibility because I want to make sure I have enough room for things to travel, like in a sus suspension component, right? Um, other times I'm worried about force transmissibility and that's 3.5.2. Transmissibility, it is, it is quite a word. Um, so, and force transmissibility is where I'm concerned about like weak connections. And I'm worried about the force that will be transmitted through a vibrating system, right? Um, so the force transmitted to the mass is the sum of the force applied by the spring damper combination, right? So from a free body diagram, Right, we can show that F of T is equal to K X minus Y plus C X dot minus Y dot. Right, those are my forces going up to the mass, right? So we're just taking out our MGs because they cancel out. Um, we're the Force, where this force is countered by the inertial mass, right? How, how is this force being counteracted? It's being counteracted by the, um, the inertial mass of the system, which is F of T is equal to negative MX double dot of T. So only consider the steady state, right? That's all we care about, again. Um, we know from before that X of P is equal to omega N of Y times the square root of omega N squared plus the sorry, two zeta omega b, that whole term squared, over omega n squared minus omega b squared, that term squared, plus two zeta omega n omega b, that term squared, cosine of omega b t minus phi 1 minus phi 2. If we differentiate this twice, right, so we can get um, uh, we get x dot of p and then we can get x double dot of p um, and combine with combine with f of t is equal to negative m x double dot of t i guess we can get that f of t is equal to m omega b squared omega n y times the square root of everything we had under there before, right? Um, 
and then the same cosine term, cosine of omega b t minus phi 1 minus b 2. I mean, we could rewrite it, but I don't think it's super important. Now, again, I want to get this as a ratio of my forcing function to my natural frequency. So I am going to um, So I am going to insert R equals omega B over omega N. And I'm going to get an expression that we will write. So as, let me write it like this. So capital F of T, my forcing function, as a function, my forcing, my forcing of the function of time is equal to capital F subscript T, I'm just going to break that out, cosine of omega B T minus phi 1 minus phi 2. Um, and now F of T, F of subscript capital T, is equal to ky r squared square root of 1 plus 2 zeta r squared over 1 minus r, sorry, 1 minus r squared that whole term squared plus two zeta r squared. Again, this can be converted to a force transmissibility to provide a normalized response such that f of t over k y equal to r squared 1 plus 2 zeta r squared over 1 minus r squared squared plus 2 zeta squared squared, that whole term squared. So now what I get is my normalized force over my stiffness in the system um, multiplied by my amplitude of the excitation going into the system. And in a plot, that looks like this. Right. So, so what's important here? Uh, one, you'll notice that I can get a lot of force for an underdamped system at resonance, right? And so you say, well, why not just make yeah. Uh, can you explain on the F of T function minus, minus P1 and minus P2? Like why do we have the minus P2? Because you had a sine and a cosine term before, and you need a, you need a way to compensate for the different phases. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah. Um, in the past, for like no damps, damping systems, we just combined it to a sine function. What is there a reason why we? made it a cosine function this time? Because damping adds a delay. Okay. Damping adds a phase change. Okay. But, I mean, I guess because we're trying to, like, show that it's, show it's phasing with cosine.
cosine, is, is, it wouldn't be the same thing if you did that with a sine function, but just added it to pi over two phase. Because we split the phases up when we assume that the solution was xp1 plus xp2. Okay. I need something to account for both of those. I don't actually know if when you solve through most practical problems that you'll get information in both V1 and V2, but kind of mathematically when you're splitting up the linear systems, you need that. Okay. Hmm. Um, I think it's more of a mathematical step than anything. Okay, so what we have here is we have our force transmissibility, right? So if I have a, um, a underdamped system, I'm going to get a lot of force because at some times I'm going to have the force of my system aligned with the movement of my mass, right? And so you can think of like a, a something that you shake, right? And then you sometimes like when it's moving away from you, you can get quite a lot of force on that, right? Because when you're trying to pull it back and the mass is trying to go out, right, you're going to get a lot of force at a contact area versus something that's very stiff like this brown line as i get higher and higher natural frequencies i'm going to get higher and higher force amplification or no, or my force transmit sorry not amplification transmissibility right so as i have a more overdamped system i'm going to have more force transmit through it and that makes sense because the stiffer something is with less damping the more force i can put through Right? Think of what a, if you've ever used a punch and a hammer, right? You take a punch, you put it against your piece of metal that you're trying to like knock a pin out of something, you hit it back with a hammer. You think that you're getting all that force through, and you are. You're getting most, you know, 98, 95% of that force if you hold the punch good and you hit it well with a hammer, right? Uh, it's transmitting through. Now, if you try to do that with a piece of cheese, <laughs> Right? You have a lot more damping and you have a lot less force transmissibility, which makes sense. String cheese, right? To use cheese to hold a building. You should not use cheese to hold a building. Um, also, wouldn't last very long. But, uh, um, yeah, so that's kind of what force transmissibility looks like. Again, note that the changeover is R over square root of 2. Um, Uh, something interesting to note here is that at the changeover point, the normalized amplitude is 2. Um, the normalized force amplitude is 2. Uh, something that's often considered in kind of like back of the envelope design ratings is dynamic loading is twice static loading. I don't know if anyone's ever heard that. First time I heard that, I was at a bolt shop. There's a shop you just go to buy bolts, and I'm sitting at the counter getting the bolt, and the guy goes, well, if it's dynamic loading, it's twice that, it's static loading. And I'm like, well, how would you know that? I'm kind of, you know, young. I was like, I'm that young. I was like 24, I'm an undergrad, but I'm a late bloomer. And then I was like, how, how would you know that? And this guy behind the counter, I, totally true story, true story. Gets out a piece of paper, draws me a free body diagram, and derives how static force, in, how dynamic force is twice that of static force. And I was so lost. And I had just finished that class like a semester before, and I had, I was like, those pictures mean something to me, chief. I'll just take my bolt. And then it was like 73 cents. And I'm like, I think I got more than 73 cents out of this trip. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's just like, uh, I learned something there. So he was a great guy. He would sell me cylinders of gas and nuts and bolts. Um, super interesting. All right, any questions on that? That displacement transmissibility, we have force transmissibility, right? Where could these be important? Uh, remember on the first day of class, we talked about this Convair C-Dart, right? And they had all sorts of displacement and force transmissibility issues with skis, right? So they've got these skis here, and then they were trying to develop, you know, adequate damping on the skis to limit both force and displacement transmissibility up to the frame. But they're also trying to do like stability. So trying to keep it on the water, you know, like fluid structure interaction challenges. Um, 
but it would just shake the the airframe apart and it would be basically just kind of beat the crap out of pilot um, because so much vibration you can't really fly a plane right i mean uh so they have a force transmissibility issue well why don't you just give it more displacement but then you have to be able to suck the, the wings up as you fly or the skis up as you fly um, long term they just put airplanes on boats which is a good answer i think <laughs>